Massachusetts became one of the first states hit hard by the coronavirus. Yeah, doctors and nurses say hospitals are swamped. The city battles COVID-19. Coronavirus numbers slowly rise. Our city is battling a major public health crisis. It's called COVID-19 and it's really dangerous if you don't take care of yourself. My aunt had to stay away from us when COVID first started because he was taking care of patients with COVID and I really missed her. The hardest part of this pandemic is like seeing that a lot of people are getting sick every day. Right now, Bostonians are rising to the occasion. The pandemic has really changed our work. We got involved early with mobile testing. Within less than a week, we had our first drive-through testing site opened up. We converted the BCEC into a hospital within days. It was in preparation of the influx of patients that were going to be coming in, hospitals being overwhelmed. It felt like a full-blown hospital. Once we realized that we had to close our sanctuaries for the safety of our parishioners, it took us about six days. Ever since COVID-19, we had to go online, and instead of going inside of the school, we have to go inside of our classes through Zoom. We have a lot of instant programs on Zoom. We have the children's librarian and they're reading to the kids online through Zoom. We don't give people any excuses not to read. Our director of education, she made sure that all of the children in our after-school programs had a Chromebook. She literally went to BPS, got the Chromebooks, hand-delivered them. The pandemic made us rethink our entire business model. We used that, that parking space. The city allowed us to open, like, put it in the tables and chairs extra. Jin Sun worked with the city of Boston for the permit to expand into the parking area. My staff and I have been outside in the snow, in the torrential rain, in the blistering heat. But we show up every day to make sure that patients and residents have access to testing. When we needed help, we were able to lean on the city and we were given resources to make sure that we're still open. They really take care of the seniors, especially during this pandemic time. I've never had to go out shopping for food because they make sure that they bring the food once a week and it's nutritional food. We have been blessed to receive money from the Boston Resiliency Fund and that helps me because it allows me to get more resources into the hands of churches so they can get more resources into the hands of people in the community. The Rent to Relief Fund is one of the city's responses to COVID. I know that one's home is where their true comfort and safety and security lies. So in the casework that we do for the Rent to Relief Fund, it helps people stay in a, their home. When we started, a majority of these board members were homeless. It's just, you know, amazing that People have taken such deep pain, humiliation, soul-crushing life experiences and turn it around and say, how can we make a difference? We need to recognize all of the heroes right now. A lot of our patients are those essential personnel working at grocery stores, working in restaurants, helping drive buses, because this pandemic is affecting everyone. Tonight, demonstrators gathered in Dorchester to share their outrage over the death of George Floyd. 46-year-old George Floyd died in police custody in Minnesota. George Floyd's murder has just intensified our consciousness, our awakeness, our commitment to understanding our racial reckoning and reconciliation in this country. There are these uh, lightning rod episodes in history and we are in one of these episodes where it's really teaching us that we have to look more carefully at what we know these populations need and deserve and what they have been denied for too long. So many people were actually able to understand finally how different demographics have systemically been disenfranchised. It's through that seeing that that has allowed me to still have hope. The Police Reform Task Force has worked tirelessly and have delivered a set of recommendations to the mayor that have been fully approved and adopted. And so that's good work. It's necessary work, but we also recognize that police reform, as important as it is, is not the only work. It has been tremendous to watch, particularly young people, in the racial social justice uprising. It has been inspiring to watch them on the front lines not just black youth and Latino youth, but 
all youth out there yelling Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Civic engagement is how we solve problems. If you're not engaged in the problems with, not only within your community, but if you're not even privy to the problems outside of your community, then it's hard to solve them. The question is, what are the changes that we're making now, that we're committed to now, that really can bring about generational change? We have a mayor who is not afraid to join with the faith community and pray for the city. You can't underestimate the impact that that has on a city when the faith community knows that they can work together with the political structure to leverage change. I think we can look towards COVID-19 when we're saying what kind of example that um, our public servants have set, how exactly we can stop it, the ways in which we can come together as a community to help each other. My message for the city of Boston is that brighter days are ahead. I feel like we are better prepared now than we ever have been before. I believe in science. I believe in our infectious disease specialists. And I'm hopeful for the community that now we have something to help combat COVID-19. I just feel like the lesson for us, for our city, for everyone in the world was do what you gotta do, get together as a community and figure it out. And I feel like you can see that lesson shining through in Boston because we never gave up. With investments in equity, health, and the well-being of our residents, we will emerge from this crisis stronger and more resilient than before. Every single one of you is making a difference, and I will never forget it and the people of Boston will never forget it. Good evening, my fellow Bostonians. One year ago, I delivered my State of the City address at Symphony Hall with an audience of over 2,000 people. We celebrated our city, and I laid out plans to move Boston forward in 2020. This year turned out different than we expected, to say the least. Tonight, we may not be in the same room, but we're still together, unified in our beliefs in Boston. And we are still moving forward. I'm joining you live from one of Boston's newest civic treasures, the completely rebuilt Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library in Nubian Square. Despite the pandemic, we made sure to advance this project, along with new parks, schools, and affordable housing, to be ready for you as we recover and rediscover our great city. 2020 was a tough year. 2020 is a year, 2021, excuse me, is a year for healing. But we have some work to do first. So I'm going to talk tonight how we must keep each other safe, get through this final stretch of the pandemic, and build a recovery that moves all our neighborhoods forward. I'm also going to talk about how we will sustain this work through an upcoming transition. As you may know, President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris have nominated me to be Labor Secretary in their administration. I've accepted this honor. If confirmed by the United States Senate, I will step down as mayor and City Council President Kim Janey will become acting mayor. I've spoken with Councilor Janey and we have begun the transition. I'm confident that the operations of city government, including our COVID response, will continue smoothly. And I want you to know the work we have done together for the past seven years has prepared Boston to build back stronger than ever. I want to start by honoring the 1,060 Bostonians we have lost to COVID-19. They are loved and missed, and their families are in my heart. I think of people I knew, like Beverly Ann Rock. Beverly was a longtime social worker in Dorchester. Her family and the thousands of families she helped miss her terribly. I think of Regina Phillips, a Boston EMT assigned to Ambulance 19 in Mattapan. Her mother, her daughter, and her co-workers miss her a warm smile each and every day. I think of Jose Fontanez, a proud father, a Boston police officer who served Jamaica Plain in this city for a quarter of a century. His son Keaton said being a police officer for him was about protecting everyone. We are a city aching with loss. Not a day goes by that I'm not speaking with a grieving family member, a worker facing unemployment, or a small business owner struggling to hang on. COVID has affected us all, but there's no doubt 
it's hit some harder than others. In the black, Latino, and immigrant communities, inequalities in health, housing, and work opportunities cause more illness and job loss. Older Bostonians and those with disabilities face the highest risk and the most isolation. Most students have been out of the classroom since March, and families have struggled with childcare. There's a mental health impact to all of this. I encourage anyone feeling overwhelmed right now to reach out to the city. We have help available. If you call 311, we can connect you to resources, counseling, or recovery services. But if 2020 was a year of struggle, it was also a year that brought out the best in our city. We saw nurses and doctors and medical staff gearing up and going into battle to save lives and provide comfort. We saw EMTs on the front lines of a global pandemic helping over 4,000 COVID patients. Firefighters brought recovery coaches to calls to help those struggling with addiction. Police officers took over 800 guns off the street, keeping us safe no matter the risk. Essential workers and city employees answered the call day after day. Residents stepped up to help each other in thousands of different ways. The heroes are all around us. As mayor, I made decisions I thought I'd never have to make to close schools, pause construction, turn our convention center into a field hospital, and cancel the Boston Marathon for the first time in its history. These decisions and many others were not easy, but we had to act to save lives. We worked with the state, with the hospitals and universities, with the businesses small and large, nonprofits and residents in every neighborhood, and we moved forward together one day at a time. We built that field hospital in five days. We created a health inequities task force to close the gaps of race and ethnicity. We provided six million meals to children, families, veterans, and seniors. We got over 40,000 laptops to our students. We got permanent rental vouchers to over 1,000 families with children at risk of homelessness. And we created the Boston Resiliency Fund, providing over, over more than $30 million to help 250,000 households in need. I want to thank every single resident in Boston for keeping your family safe, helping your neighbors, and moving our city forward. And I want to say to you tonight, we may be hurting, but the state of our city is resilient, the state of our city is united, the state of our city is hopeful, and the state of our city is deep down Boston strong. We must keep drawing on our strengths and on each other. Recovery certainly won't be easy. The virus will be with us for much of the year. The economic impacts will continue. There will be more hard decisions to make. But whatever happens, I know one thing. Boston will stay true to its values. We believe in keeping each other safe. We believe in caring for those who are vulnerable. We believe in justice and opportunity for everyone. In recovery, we must double down on those values. So here are the priorities that we've established. It starts with keeping you safe. That means making decisions grounded in science, wearing our masks and taking precautions to slow the spread of this virus, providing free COVID testing, and helping you get access to vaccines that will put this pandemic behind us. Scientists are clear these vaccines are safe, and we are empowering residents to share information in your communities and in your languages. Our first responders have begun to get vaccinated. I urge you to do as well. The next top priority is getting our students safely back into the Boston Public Schools. Yesterday, we announced a plan to safely reopen all remaining schools for hybrid and in-person learning. I want to thank our superintendent and the teachers for working together. I want to thank all of our school leaders and staff, as well as our students and families and administrators for doing an incredible job this year. This is a community committed to learning. We are ready to do more now than ever to close the opportunity gaps that COVID further exposed. We'll keep providing laptops for every student. We'll ensure there's a social worker and a family advocate in every school. We're expanding our food, clothing, and housing supports. And we're building and modernizing schools all across the district because we believe in all of our students. I want to talk now about economic recovery. We've been hit hard by the COVID recession. 
but I want businesses and working families to know that we are moving forward. For seven years, we built one of the most dynamic and resilient economies in the world. And in 2020, despite the pandemic, we approved $8.5 billion of new investment in our city, creating a potential of 35,000 new jobs. As we build back, we can bring these good jobs to every neighborhood. Green jobs through our resiliency investment and climate policies. Tourism jobs promoting diversity in businesses in every neighborhood. And good city jobs. This year, the state legislature approved our plan for the first ever fire cadet program, a new pathway into firefighting careers. I want to say a word to our small business owners. You are the soul of our economy, and you sacrificed so much for the safety of our city. I will never forget it. So far, we've provided $26 million in resources to nearly 4,000 small businesses. These new opportunities, from outdoor dining to reopening grants, are just the beginning. We must build back the restaurants and bars, the stores and salons, the gyms and the art studios that make our neighbors, neighborhood so special, along with the hotels and museums and theaters that tell our story and bring visitors into our city. We'll do that by keeping small business at the center of our recovery. We must also keep building homes for everyone. Last year, we focused on keeping people safely housed. That work continues. At the same time, we built new homes for seniors, veterans, and families, and we stayed the national leader in subsidized affordable housing. Now we're taking new steps forward. Tomorrow, we become the first city in the United States with a fair housing requirement written into our zoning code. It's a powerful tool to protect residents from displacement. We're also making home ownership a reality for more families. Last week, we secured state legislation to help more people buy homes and find affordable housing. I thank the legislature for passing those bills. They will grow our middle class and help families stay in our city. We're expanding our work to end youth and family homelessness. We've created the first ever city-funded rental voucher program so that more families can live in neighborhoods they love. And after housing over 2,300 formerly homeless individuals we are ready to build more of the supportive housing that changes people's lives. We can't forget another health care crisis hurting our community, substance use disorder. We've maintained in-person recovery services and telehealth counseling since March. I thank the staff for doing this life-saving work. Addiction is a national and regional epidemic, but the concentration of services in Boston brings intense impacts especially to the South End, Roxbury, and South Boston. I understand why residents are frustrated, and I thank you for understanding how difficult the situation is. I only ask us to remember we are one community. Our enemy is not each other, but a disease, and we will only beat it if we work together. We have not stopped fighting to build a bridge in a regional recovery campus on Long Island. We are closer than ever to making that a reality. I ask everyone in Boston and in Quincy and across our region to be part of the solution. This year, science guided our work. The climate crisis required the same decisive action. Based in facts, working as a community, protecting our city. That's why I made sure that Boston never strayed from the Paris Agreement, even when the White House did. As chair of the U.S. Climate Mayors, I've led a coalition of cities ready to work with the Biden-Harris administration and bring America back to the fight. Here's what this year will bring. Already, we've issued our first ever green bonds to fund projects to protect our city. Next month, Community Choice Electricity starts. From now on, we'll be buying affordable energy from climate-friendly sources. We've also moved major investments forward in resilient parks, protecting our city from flooding with great open spaces for you to enjoy. In the end, climate action is not about global conferences or complex formulas. It's about a child here in Roxbury who needs clean air to breathe, a park to play in, and a future filled with opportunity. That's who I've been working for. The urgency of the work has never been more clear. Last summer, George Floyd's murder sparked a long overdue reckoning with racism. I thank black Bostonians for the way you made your voices heard. 
I thank everyone who joined the movement, black, white, Latino, Asian, and indigenous people standing together. The gravity of this moment weighed on me. I'm proud of the work that we've done in Boston, but doing better than before isn't enough. We need to address all the ways systemic racism hurts people in our city. In the end, I went back to what I learned in recovery. I listened to those who have been there to tell their stories and speak their truths. Young black members of my team shared their thoughts first. I held Zoom calls with our black employee network and I listened. I reached out to leaders and activists and clergy. They spoke about daily fears that something will happen to a loved one. They described lifelong anxiety around being prejudged and denied opportunities. I heard grief, not just over lives lost, but over children's future limited. I will never forget those conversations, and I resolved to take action. We declared racism a public health crisis. We launched a health equity plan to end disparities for good. We shifted millions of dollars into youth, trauma, and mental health programs. We enacted historic police reforms with black and brown Bostonians leading the work. The result is a new national model for oversight and accountability. And we're reorganizing city government, appointing a chief of equity to drive this work forward. The pandemic made it clear a community crisis demands a community-wide response. So I'm asking all of us to accept this responsibility as our own and commit to fighting racism. It's our deepest moral obligation, and it's our greatest opportunity for growth. No city is better prepared than Boston to meet this moment. I know that because I've spent every day for seven years working with you to strengthen our city. We set a new standard for fiscal management, earning a AAA bond rating every single year, even in 2020. Now that work is paying off. A national study reported in the New York Times named Boston the city best prepared to come back strong from COVID. We made the right decisions in the good times, so Boston has the strength to move forward now. Here's what that means for you. It means this beautiful new library. It's part of a $130 million citywide investment, the biggest upgrade for Boston Library since the branch system was created over 100 years ago. You'll see a completely rebuilt parks and playgrounds from the North End to Mattapan, and major upgrades at Boston Common and Franklin Park. We're investing more in our parks than any time since the Emerald Necklace was created in the 1800s. You'll see a new senior center in East Boston, a fully renovated Curly Community Center in South Boston, a revitalized public housing in Charlestown, and a world-class Boston Arts Academy High School in Fenway. You'll see a renovated EMS Academy and a new ambulance bay in West Roxbury for quicker response times. And Boston's first brand new firehouse in 30 years, Engine 42 in Roxbury. You'll see miles of resurfaced roads and rebuilt sidewalks with bus and bike lanes. To top it off, you'll see, you'll see, we'll complete the first full makeover of City Hall Plaza since it was built over 50 years ago. These are the goods we hold in common as Bostonians. We have strengthened them more than ever, and now we need them more than ever. They are the places we'll gather as we emerge from this pandemic to reconnect, bring every voice into our democracy, and build the future together. I believe in Boston. This is the city that welcomed my immigrant parents. This is the city that picked me up when I needed second chances. This is the city where I fought side by side with you for marriage equality, immigrant rights, addiction treatment, criminal justice reform, education funding, and good middle class jobs. We've faced down big challenges together, just as we're doing with COVID. We have always prevailed, and we're not about to give up now. In eight days, we'll have friends and allies in the White House who believe cities and believes in cities and shares our values. As a member of that administration, I will work to make sure it's the best federal partner in Boston and America and cities I've ever had. The truth is, I'm not going to Washington alone. I'm bringing Boston with me. This city is not just my hometown, it's my heart. 
It's my mother and father's kitchen table at Taft Street talking about helping people. It's the teachers and nuns and priests and clergy who guided me. It's every kid I coached in Little League, CYO, or at the Little House. Everyone who shared recovery with me or reached out for help. My union and my labor family. My mentors and colleagues at the State House. And all the elected officials I served with in Boston over the years. It's the staff at City Hall, every employee of the City of Boston, police officers, firefighters, and EMTs, public works and transportation, libraries and parks, security office custodians and inspectors, neighborhood liaisons and 311 call takers, teachers and principals and BPS staff, those who serve our veterans, seniors, youth, and immigrants, women, small businesses, and disability communities. Everyone who works in housing, homelessness, recovery services, the environment, and public health. All my fellow public servants, including Owen Cannon, who wrote every single one of my State of the Cities. Deep in my heart is my mother, it's Laurie, it's my brother Johnny, it's Lauren and Jeff. You are always with me, and I love you. In the end, I carry with me the people of Boston from every neighborhood, every child who shared a dream with me, every senior who shared a memory with me, every business owner who welcomed me in, every nonprofit or community leader I worked with, anyone watching right now who cares about their family and the future of this city. Seven years ago, at my first inauguration, I said, I will listen, I will learn, I will lead. We are sworn in together, and we are in this together, all of us. I meant it. Every minute of every day of this job, I spent listening to you, learning from you, and working with you and working for you. I will never forget it. I will forever be grateful. We have tough days ahead of us, but Boston's been knocked down before, and we always get back up. In 2021, Boston will rise up again. We will leave no one behind. And our city will be stronger than ever. I want to say to all of you in Boston, thank you for this honor. God bless you and keep you safe. God bless the city of Boston and God bless the United States of America.